The hand with the fingers extended demonstrates in three dimensions the course of the fibers from the thalamus to the frontal lobe. The thalamus is represented by the wristwatch. The fibers to the motor area go upward like the thumb to the convexity. Those to the frontal pole run forward like the second and third fingers, while those to the base curve around the anterior horn of the ventricle like the fourth and fifth fingers. It is possible, therefore, as illustrated by the leucotome, to sever the fibers to the frontal pole by the lateral and medial cuts, and then to sever those to the base of the frontal lobe by elevating the handle of the instrument. The connections between the thalamus and the frontal lobe are clearly shown in this illustration from Flexig's monograph on myelinization of the infant brain. The projection pathways from the thalamus to the occipital and temporal lobes are well myelinated, as well as those to the frontal projection. Beyond the anterior horn of the lateral ventricles, the radiation bends rather sharply toward the midline in a sort of elbow. It is the aim of transorbital lobotomy to cut across this tract of fibers close to the elbow. Turning now to the operation itself, very little preparation is necessary for transorbital lobotomy. This patient came to the hospital this morning after breakfast, and if all goes well, she will leave tomorrow afternoon. The operation can be done under any general anesthetic, but electroshock is preferred because of its familiarity to the psychiatrist. Transorbital lobotomy is performed during the stage of post-convulsive coma. The electrodes are applied, and the first shock is given. The convulsion lasts about 40 seconds. When the patient shows signs of returning consciousness, a second convulsion is administered. Usually three successive convulsions are necessary, but in old people a single one may be sufficient, while in a sturdy young person four or even six convulsions may be administered without danger. Now that the convulsion has subsided, the nurse holds a towel over the nose and mouth of the patient. The operator lifts the upper eyelid, inserts the leucotome into the conjunctival sac, and aims it parallel with the bony ridge of the nose. He drives the point through the orbital plate, and at a depth of five centimeters, swings the handle far laterally. He then returns the instrument to a slightly oblique position, still parallel with the bony ridge of the nose, and drives it two centimeters further. Steadying the patient's head, he then moves the handle of the instrument about 20 degrees medially and 30 degrees laterally. In this latter position, he strongly elevates the handle of the instrument, often fracturing the orbital plate. and then finally returns the instrument to the parasagittal plane. The operation on the left side is seen from the profile view, which best illustrates the deep frontal cut. It will be noted that the instrument upon removal appears clear and shiny, but in view of its contact with the skin of the lower eyelid, different instruments are used for operation on the two sides. In this second patient, after operation, there is no damage visible.